gathered by the, by the lights. These, these, these ones here, I'm, I'm going to end up with a massive migraine at the end of it. Hello, everybody. Hi. Whoa, this is, this is too much. This, this has to come down. Okay. Thank you all for coming along today. And uh, I wish I could see you. Um, but uh, thank you very much indeed. So look, I'm, I'm uh, going to give a talk about uh, some mysterious aspects of ancient America. Um, part of this talk is going to dwell on religious and spiritual ideas. Um, I think it's beyond dispute that religious and spiritual ideas are amongst the most long-lived in human culture. We can take the case of the Abrahamic religions, which really have uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which really have their origin going back to the time of Abraham and Ur of the Chaldees, more than 2000 BC. So, so those religions have been carrying ideas forward for 4,000 years, so the notion that ideas could be transmitted carried in religious vehicles over thousands of years is not an absurd one. I'm going to be drawing attention to certain specific and very bizarre connections between the religion of ancient Egypt and the religion of the Mississippi Valley. Uh, and I want to be clear right at the outset, I'm not saying that the ancient Egyptians sent missionaries to the Mississippi Valley, or vice versa. What I'm saying is that these similarities are best explained by a remote shared ancestor, that we're looking at a legacy passed down from a very uh, ancient time. So these are, naturally, of course, in a talk on ancient America, I'll begin with Egypt. Uh, <laughs> these are the oldest religious writings of Egypt. They're the, uh, the pyramid texts, um, and, and they're so-called because they're written inside pyramids of the fifth and sixth dynasty at Saqqara, about 20 miles south of Giza. And um, that's the pyramid tra text translated into English. They're part of a wide body of literature, of which the most famous is certainly the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead. They all convey essentially the same ideas in essentially uh, the same words. On the left here is, in the, is the book of what is in the Duat. And the Duat is the ancient Egyptian name for the afterlife realm, for the netherworld, uh, ruled over by the god Osiris. And uh, uh, it was, uh, this is Osiris from the Temple of Dendera, and there's no dispute about this. When the ancient Egyptians looked up at the sky and saw the constellation of Orion, very important constellation for them. They saw it as the celestial image of their god of resurrection and rebirth, uh, Osiris. And, and he is positioned beside the banks of the winding waterway, which we call the Milky Way. And it was along that Milky Way that the souls of the deceased were said to make a journey uh, after death. Um, in our society, we're very focused on material things and, and uh, empty-headed politicians wasting our time with stupidities. Um, but uh, the ancient Egyptians really, <laughs> that shower of useless no-goods in Westminster, <laughs> what a waste of space. The ancient Egyptians, <laughs> the ancient Egyptians uh, attended to more serious matters and really asked themselves the question, what ha happens after death? And they came to very specific ideas that the soul rises to the constellation of Orion moves over to the Milky Way and then makes a journey along the Milky Way where it faces certain challenges and ordeals. This is set out in the Books of the Dead, uh, written inside the 5th and 6th Dynasty Pyramids. Here in this double exposure is the Great Pyramid of Egypt. The Great Pyramid has uh, no inscriptions inside it, but the entire complex of Giza, the three Great Pyramids matching the three stars of Orion's belt, this is the discovery of my friend Robert Baval, and the Great Sphinx looking at the constellation of Leo as it rises on the equinox. This is the Duat sky region. The afterlife realm was said to lie in the sky. The Milky Way ran through it, and it roughly from the constellation of Orion to the constellation of Leo. And that's what they've built on the ground, taking the Nile into the story, a three-dimensional representation of the central area of the afterlife journey. But weirdly, it's the sky as it looked 12,800 to 11,600 years ago, not the sky as it looked uh, in 2500 BC when the pyramids are supposed to have been built. How does the soul of the deceased ascend to the Duat? This is made very clear by a narrow shaft cut through the southern side of the Great Pyramid of Egypt, which is angled up and points directly at the lowest of the three stars of Orion's belt. And it's widely accepted that this star shaft was a soul shaft, whereby the soul of the deceased would leap up 
to the constellation of Orion, pass through the constellation of Orion, and begin its afterlife journey along the winding waterway or the Milky Way as we know it. So this is, um, of course, a much less spectacular sight than Giza, but let's not forget that more than 90% of the Native American uh, earthwork sites that were recorded in the early 19th century are now gone. Most of them have been destroyed. Uh, I did not expect when I came to Moundville in Alabama to find a system of ideas that was identical to the ancient Egyptian system of ideas. However, this turns out to be the case. I can't go into it in depth. Uh, a group of scholars have broken the code of the Mississippi Valley civilization. They didn't write things down. They used symbolism. And uh, it's possible to trace that symbolism into surviving Native American cultures. Um, and we now know that this symbol, the hand and the eye as it's called, that's not an eye, that's a portal. And what the hand represents is the constellation of Orion. That's how the Native Americans saw the constellation of Orion. Uh, as a group, the knotted serpents and the hand and eye are believed to be a representation of the night sky. Uh, the serpents are the ropes that join the earth and sky, and the palm of the hand is the portal or doorway through which the spirits of the dead can ascend the path of souls or Milky Way in their extended journey to the realm of the dead. All of this was new to me when I went to Moundville. I was astonished to see these similarities. The gateway or portal between the celestial realms and the earth disk rendered as an open hand with a man in its palm. We know that hand is part of the constellation of Orion. Once the portal was crossed, the souls of the dead began their journey by walking along a road or ribbon of light, the Milky Way, exactly as in Egypt. The Milky Way was the path of souls, and Moundville itself was seen um, not only as a, a symbolic gateway to the realm of the dead, but also as the materialized image of the sacred domain on Earth, exactly as the Giza complex is the materialized image of the Duat, uh, netherworld realm uh, on Earth. And this is a typical representation of the portal in the eye, in the hand. We see how the Orion's belt is represented by the wrist of the hand and other stars. And the Orion nebula is in fact the, the portal through which the soul is believed to uh, make its journey to the Milky Way. Uh, Professor George Langford is one of the leading scholars who've helped to break the code of the Mississippi Valley civilization. And what he's telling us is that the portal in the hand must be entered by a leap at the optimum time. Just like that leap from the pyramids up to Orion's belt in Native America also, they must leap up to the constellation of Orion. Um, George Langford also tells us, uh, draws our attention to various challenges that the soul faces on its journey through the Native American afterlife. Uh, and one of these is a fearsome image of a brain smasher, usually a woman whose task is to destroy memory and humanity by removing or smashing the brain. There are repeated references to this figure. She's called the brain smasher or the brain taker, and her role is the annihilation and permanent destruction of unworthy souls, the damned, on the afterlife journey. This rang a bell because there is a curious scene uh, in the ancient Egyptian book of what is in the Duat. Here's the full scene, and I've elaborated uh, here on the left uh, what, what's going on here. And what we're seeing is a man who is smashing out his own brains with a hatchet. And I felt instinctively, although I don't read hieroglyphs, that that goddess was not encouraging him to stop doing that. With those hands outstretched, she seems to be exerting will to make him smash out his own brains. But I needed to know for sure. So I went to the British Museum, and I got an expert in hieroglyphs to translate these glyphs for me. Uh, and uh, she lives from the blood of the damned and from what these gods provide her, that bar soul who belongs to the damned, the demolishing one who cuts the damned to pieces. In other words, her role is exactly the same as the role of the brain smasher uh, in the Native American system. Uh, in the Native American system, there is a raptor on the path of souls, and it's a challenge or an obstacle to the soul of the deceased. It has the power to block the path of the deceased. Um, and it's associated with the star Denim, which is situated at this split uh, in the Milky Way. Um, and uh, the ancient Egyptians also had a bird on the path of souls that had the power to block the progress of the soul. Uh, I know it sounds a bit daft. It wasn't a raptor. It was an ostrich. 
Uh, but in these traditions, often the basic idea is adapted to local circumstances. So the soul says, hail to you, ostrich, which is on the bank of the winding waterway, open my way that I may pass. There are monstrous serpents in the ancient Egyptian netherworld, serpents with wings. Uh, and we see many winged serpents um, in the ancient American netherworld as well. Uh, the underwater panther uh, is uh, one of the figures on the path of souls in the ancient American netherworld, and it's clearly feline. Um, and uh, I'm struck by the resemblance to the Great Sphinx of Giza. I and my colleagues have always maintained that the Great Sphinx, more than 12,000 years old, was originally a lion-headed monument, and that its head was recarved into a human form during the dynastic period of ancient Egypt. And I'm just struck by the similarity of position of these two creatures, even the way that the tail uh, curves around uh, at the back. Um, the Birdman is an important fi figure in the ancient Native American death journey. Uh, he represents the triumph of life over death, and he's depicted as a hawk-headed man. And uh, the figure in the ancient Egyptian system who represents the triumph of life over death is the god Horus, and he is also a hawk-headed man. Um, amongst the skiddy Pawnee of Native America, the skin of a wildcat was the spots on the skin of a wildcat were seen as representing the stars. This is true also uh, amongst uh, the, the priests of ancient Egypt who performed the mortuary ceremonies. This leopard skin was seen as representing the sky. And the chief of the astronomers at Heliopolis, the cult center of the Giza pyramids, not only wore a leopard skin, but it was actually embossed with stars. And uh, the skiddy Pawnee also have a chief of the astronomers and lo and behold, he turns out to wear a robe embossed with stars uh, as well. At a certain point, I have to ask myself whether all this is simply dismissible as coincidence or whether there's something else uh, going on. If we go to the Amazon rainforest of South America, the purpose of the portal to the land of the dead is served by a beverage, and that beverage is called uh, ayahuasca, which means uh, the vine of the dead. I speak from some experience here because I've had more than 70 journeys with uh, ayahuasca uh, over the years. Um, with, uh, with ayahuasca, uh, it is very common after the shamans have uh, experienced their visions of their, 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 their journey that they depict what they've seen. And these depictions of what they've seen in the visionary state include an enormous amount of geometry. Uh, the, the Tucano uh, of the Amazon, they call their shamans, their payes, they're huge drinkers of ayahuasca. Here we see a Tucano shaman uh, guiding his son through an ayahuasca experience, helping him to navigate the infinite terrain of the other side. And again, as is so often the case, after they've experienced their visions, the Tucano will frequently paint them or depict them in any medium. Uh, here a shaman is depicting his geometric visions on sand. Um, Actually, anybody in the Tucano community may drink uh, ayahuasca. Uh, they give a teaspoon of ayahuasca to uh, a newborn child. Um, but when serious work is to be done, that work will be done by a group of payes uh, who understand that this world is affected by other worlds normally invisible to us, and that they must enter those other realms and negotiate there. And so what happens is that you'll get a group of shamans together, they'll drink just unbelievable quantities of ayahuasca until they feel that they are ascending to the Milky Way. A familiar theme. And this ascent is not easily accomplished. The apprentice can only get a few feet off the ground, but the more experience he has, the higher he gets until he can leap up into the sky and in a single soaring flight uh, reach the zenith. Um, much of the great work on the Tucano comes from Rachel, uh, Gerardo Rachel Dolmatov, that's his book, Beyond the Milky Way. And in it, he depicts the entrance to the other world as, as uh, this is a, a reproduction of a painting by a Tucano artist, uh, entrance to the other world as depicted in Tucano ayahuasca art. The Tucano uh, have an intriguing origin myth. It sounds like a settlement mission. They say that um, their ancestors were brought to the Amazon by supernaturals who included the daughter of the sun and an individual who steered the canoe of settlement who was called the helmsman. 
Uh, and, and these supernaturals traveled all over the Amazon and they selected special regions where the Tucano ancestors should settle. Uh, and this is still remembered strongly to this day, although it is said to have happened thousands and thousands of years ago in the past. If we go to ancient Egypt, we can find another story of a settlement mission. And that story is in the Temple of Horus at Edfu in Upper Egypt. And it is inscribed in the inner and outer enclosure walls of that temple in a group of texts known as the Edfu building texts. And uh, that's what the Edfu building texts uh, look like. And this is the story that they tell. They speak of a homeland of the primeval ones that was destroyed in a great flood. And they tell how the primeval ones, the gods, came to Egypt and established religion by building primeval mounds up and down the land. And, and we hear how the homeland of the primeval ones was destroyed by some sort of object that came from the heavens and, and split it, and pierced it, and then it was flooded, completely flooded, and the majority of the divine inhabitants died. Uh, however, there were survivors. Um, and those uh, survivors, we are told, wandered the world, and that their purpose was to restart the civilization of the gods, to reincarnate it, to bring it, to bring it rebirth. Uh, and in order to do that, they settled amongst peoples all around the world who were not gods, who were not supernaturals. They settled amongst them, and they tried to teach them their system of ideas. And this project was pursued not only in Egypt, the Edfu texts make clear, but in many other lands. Um, and I think that one of those lands was South America, and specifically the Amazon, which covers roughly 7 million square kilometers, of which uh, about 5.5 million square kilometers remain entirely covered by rainforest. The rest has been cleared by the ugly materialism and greed of, of our so-called civilization. Um, but uh, five and a half million square kilometers are still covered by rainforest, dense rainforest, hardly visited at all by archaeologists. The archaeology in these five and a half million square kilometers is minimal, and that's a lot of land. That's an area larger than the entire subcontinent uh, of India. Um, and here are some sensational headlines, as you would expect from the Daily Mail. Uh, were Aborigines the first Americans? But actually, the science behind the headlines is even more sensational. This is a paper in Nature, um, and it's evidence for two founding populations of the Americas. And what they found is something odd. You see, the peopling of the Americas is supposed to have taken place this way, up through Asia, across the Bering Straits, which were a land bridge during the Ice Age, down through North America, through Central America, and into South America. But you get this very strong DNA signal, which is Papua New Guinea, Melanesia, Australian Aborigines, repeated in the Amazon. These, the certain tribes in the Amazon are closely related to the Australo-Melanesians, Australasians. If they come this way, you would find that DNA signal in North America and Central America, but you don't. You only find it in the heart of the Amazon jungle. Uh, and furthermore, it's very old. The genotyping of, of ancient skeletal remains is, uh, is a boom area in science right now. And uh, although they're very rare from that period, a 10,400-year-old skeleton uh, was very recently found and genotyped uh, in the Amazon. And it turns out to have that same Australasian DNA signal that we find among surviving tribes in the Amazon today. So that tells us that that signal reached the Amazon at least 10,400 years ago. And all the indications are it was earlier than that, and the scientists suggest that it must have reached South America in the late Pleistocene, that is, near the end of the Ice Age. So that's the mystery. What on earth is Australasian DNA doing in the middle of the Amazon jungle, but not on the route of migration that we've been told was always taken? I talked to Eski Willislev, who is professor of genetics at the University of Copenhagen, one of the leading figures in this new research, and he admitted frankly that no one has a good explanation of the Australasian Melanesian signal. Everything is speculation. Um, and one of the speculations that he was prepared to countenance is that someone holding this signal comes into the Americas, not through Beringia, but crossing into South America across the ocean, based purely on the genetic data. This is the most parsimonious explanation, but it doesn't make practical sense. And when I questioned him on this, he said the reason it doesn't make practical sense is because archaeologists tell me that nobody was able to sail the world's oceans during the Ice Age. 
And I said, have you really checked out how scientific archaeologists are? And he said, well, we in science rely on, on the findings of other scientists, and it's not our role to question them. Um, I wonder uh, 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 about this, because it seems to me that that DNA signal from Australasia in the heart of the Amazon going back to the Ice Age is evidence that people were crossing the oceans during the last Ice Age. Uh, and indeed, I've gone into this in, in previous books, but uh, there are maps that have survived, maps that were based on older source maps now lost, which show the world much as it looked uh, during the last Ice Age. For example, this huge extension of Indonesia and uh, Papua New Guinea joined to Australia and so on. Japan, uh, the islands of Honshu, Kyushu and Shikoku were all one land mass between 13,500 and 12,400 years ago. The Pisigano chart of 1424, the earliest map of Japan, shows that island as one land mass, not as three. Uh, and Japan today, you can see quite clearly that the island of Shikoku is a separate island. Um, this is the Pinkerton world map drawn in 1818, based on the latest science of the time. As you can see, something is missing from the picture, and that's Antarctica. And the reason it's missing from the picture is because our civilization didn't discover Antarctica until 1819. However, if you go back to these older maps, based on even older lost source maps, and I could show you dozens of these, you find Antarctica very much present, in the right place, but a bit bigger than it is today, much as it looked uh, during the last Ice Age. Um, here's the Canepa map from 1489. It shows a huge series of river channels and lakes in the Sahara Desert, and recent surveys, 2015 radar survey of Mauritania showed a river channel, enormous one, in exactly the place uh, indicated on this ancient map. But that river channel disappeared thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, a map of the British Isles. Here's Ireland. West of Ireland, around about 13,000 years ago, there lay a small circular island exposed by the lowered sea levels of the last ice age. Oddly enough, that island turns up in exactly the right place on this ancient map, based on even more ancient source maps now lost. Uh, the Piri Reis map is another one of those maps. He actually tells us in his own handwriting on the map that he based it on more than 100 older source maps. Um, I'm not going to go into the controversies of the Piri Reis map, but there's one thing I want to draw your attention to, and that's this island up off the east coast of North America. I've blown it up here. Uh, you can see that there is what appears to be a road or a row of megaliths running up the middle of that island. And exactly where that island is, you can still see a road or a row of megaliths. It's called the Bimini Road. I've dived on it myself. And the mystery is, how come it appears on a map drawn in 1513 based on older source maps? Were those older source maps created when that island was actually above water? Uh, the Amazon seems like an unlikely setting for science. But uh, there's more than 150,000 different species of plants and trees uh, in the Amazon. And if you want to make ayahuasca, you're going to have to find just two of those plants and trees. And you're going to have to put them together. The DMT, the most powerful visionary substance known to man, um, is contained in these leaves, the chacruna bush. But uh, you could make a tea of hundreds of those leaves. Drink it as much as you like, and you'll have no DMT experience, because there's an enzyme in our gut called monoamine oxidase that switches off DMT on contact. DMT is not normally orally active. However, if you cook them together with the ayahuasca vine, well, the ayahuasca vine contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. So it shuts down that enzyme in the gut and allows the DMT in the leaves, once they're cooked together, to be absorbed orally. Uh, producing an extraordinary four to six hour journey to other realms. Uh, Curare uh, is another mystery of the Amazon. I I'm showing the Nazca lines on the left here, the geometry of the Nazca lines. Interestingly, the animals that are shown on the Nazca lines are all Amazonian am uh, animals. This is a uh, uh, Myrmecium, an Amazonian ant spider. And then we, you can hardly see it in this light, but this is the monkey with its prehensile tail, uh, uh, an Amazonian monkey. Uh, and I'm, I'm putting that there because when you're a hunter in the Amazon and your food includes monkeys and they're New World monkeys with prehensile tails, what you don't want to do is to shoot them 
just with an ordinary arrow. Because if you do that, as they start to fall from the tree, their tails will wrap around the branch of the tea tree and they'll be left hanging from that branch, maybe 200 feet above you. And you're going to have to do a lot of work to get your dinner. But if you tip your arrow with curare, which is a muscle relaxant, what will happen is that that prehensile tail cannot wrap around the branch of the tree and the monkey drops to the ground. Uh, Eleven different plants are needed to make curare. Uh, it's high science, uh, the invention of this of this uh, potion, um, and indeed we use curare now in synthetic form uh, in modern anesthesiology. Here's Francisco de Orellana, he was a Spanish conquistador, he was the first Spaniard to cross the entire length of South America from the west to the east along the Amazon River. And along the way, uh, in the 1540s, he reported uh, seeing signs of advanced civilization, huge numbers of people, advanced arts and crafts, enormous cities. A hundred years later, as other Westerners started to go into the Amazon, they couldn't find any trace of these cities. And they said, oh, Oriana must have made the whole story up. It was a complete fantasy. Uh, but it turned out it wasn't a fantasy. The cities had been there, but they had been utterly devastated by smallpox that swept through the Amazon and killed everybody. And within a century, they were totally overgrown to the jungle, and that's why later explorers didn't find them, until our modern age and the tragic clearances of the Amazon have begun to reveal these garden cities, many of which were far larger than European cities uh, of that same period. How did they feed those populations? Because rainforest soils are poor. They fed them with an incredible man-made soil, the origins of which go back 8,000 years at least, probably, probably much further. Remember, five and a half million square kilometers, hardly any archaeology has been done. It's called terra preta, black earth. It contains a unique combination of microbes uh, and biochar. And it's so fertile that you can take a handful of 8,000-year-old terra preta and add it to barren soil, and that soil will become fertile and able to support life. And this is a man-made soil created thousands of years ago to make it possible for large populations to inhabit the Amazon. In the Brazilian state of Acre, in the southwestern Amazon, we are now finding evidence of huge geoglyphs, very like the Nazca geoglyphs, full of geometry. Um, and I'll show you a few examples here. They're, these are all on the scale of hundreds of meters. Um, here's a square and a circle combination. Uh, often you'll see two geometric figures combined as there. Uh, here's an enormous paired circle geoglyph from the Amazon. Um, a square and a circle combination again. All of these are discoveries just in the last uh, decade or so. Tequino once covered 37 acres, two principal squares are left, the larger measuring 210 by 210 meters. Um, and uh, I don't know why my clicker just does this to me all the time. It's so annoying. Um, but there's uh, Fazenda Piranha and uh, Severina Calazans, both of these sites are perfectly oriented to true north, south, east, and west with extremely high precision. Uh, Severino Calazans, the larger square, has the same footprint as the uh, Great Pyramid of Giza, measuring 230 meters along each side. Um, and uh, this site, Fazenda Colorada, uh, we've reproduced this map of it here in the middle. Uh, it's a rather complex site, but what intrigued me about it was this element, which is so like the entrance to the other world, as depicted in Tucano art. Uh, since there is no evidence that people ever lived in these geoglyph sites, uh, it's apparent that they were used for some other purpose. Were they used to serve the afterlife journey of the soul in the same way that we know the pyramids of Giza were? Uh, the ancient Egyptian netherworld, the Duat, is full of geometric forms. Uh, and uh, back to the Amazon, <laughs> as well as these huge earthworks, let's call them henges, as well as these huge henges, there are numbers of megalithic sites, including stone circles. This one, Rego Grande, is actually called locally the Amazonian Stonehenge. Um, and uh, all the stones are carefully propped and levered into position to do a particular job. And that job uh, is to target uh, a key moment of the year. We know the summer solstice, the winter solstice, and the equinox are the three 
key moments of the year. Uh, and in this case, what happens at Regal Grande is that Stone 3 targets the, tracks the entire path of the sun uh, on the winter solstice. Uh, and Stones 1 and 2 line up to target the rising point of the sun uh, on the winter solstice. Very carefully, very high precision work. Um, Stonehenge is another solstitial site. Stonehenge, uh, the alignment from Stone 16 through the heel stone gives you the summer solstice sunrise, and you can see the summer solstice sun rising behind the heel stone there. Uh, winter solstice is what Karnak is all about. The axis of the Temple of Karnak is a kilometer in length, and on the winter solstice only, it lines up with the rising point of the sun so that the sun sits exactly on that gateway in the middle of the axis. Uh, this is what you see if you get up illegally on the back of the Great Sphinx. Naturally, you see the back of the Sphinx's head, uh, but if you were to get up there uh, on the spring equinox, this is what you'd see. You'd see that the Great Sphinx is carefully cut and designed to face the rising sun on the equinoxes. It's an equinoctial marker. So is Angkor. Stand at the central, in the center of the central causeway. You'll see the sun rising up the central tower until it sits on the top and lights the whole place up like a fairy tale kingdom. Um, so let's go back to North America now. This is Serpent Mound in Ohio. Uh, this beautiful serpentine form built on top of a natural ridge. I'm going to have to stand over here and press this button. Um, and I'm trying to show you the, the ridge here. This is the natural ridge on which Serpent Mound stands and then the ancients created this beautiful mound on top of it. You can see there's a curve to the left in the ridge, and that's mirrored by the man-made mound on top of it. LiDAR reveals the same thing. There's the mound, the, the ridge, and there's the man-made mound on top of it. Um, and uh, interestingly, what Serpent Mound does is it targets the summer solstice sunset. That natural ridge already targeted the summer solstice sunset. It was, it was a place that the ancients realized that Earth spoke to sky. And then they came along and they monumentalized it by creating Serpent Mound on top of that natural ridge. And uh, the net effect uh, is uh, the same kind of thing that you get at Stonehenge. And here's where I need to tell you of the new research, because the new research has shown that Stone 16 and the heel stone were always present on Salisbury Plain. They were natural features. And the rest of Stonehenge was brought from Wales, from the Marlborough Downs, to honor and memorialize that place where ground whispered to sky, exactly as happens at uh, Serpent Mound in Ohio. So this is, the, this is what you see at Serpent Mound. My wife Santa took this photograph with a drone 400 feet above. We can see the head of the serpent there, seeking the sun, this is heading towards sunset on the summer solstice. And then finally, you can see the, the perfection of the alignment with which the head of the serpent targets the rising sun. Uh, north of Serpent Mound, there are two extraordinary geometric sites, High Bank Works and Newark Earthworks. I'm going to focus mainly on Newark. The interesting thing is they're 60 miles apart, but the High Bank Octagon Circle combination stands exactly at right angles at a 90 degree angle to the Newark Octagon Circle combination. To do that across a distance of 60 miles is a highly advanced feat of surveying geometry and setting out. Uh, this is an aerial view of the Newark octagon and circle combination. Um, those parts that still survive are now largely contained within a private country club, including an 18-hole golf course which promotes itself as unlike any other in the world. It is designed around famous prehistoric Native American earthworks that come into play on 11 of the holes. And there we see it. Actually, I'm grateful it's there, because it wouldn't be there if it hadn't been part of a country club. It would have been turned into agricultural land. It would have been plowed under, or a housing estate. At least it has been somewhat preserved. Interesting parallel between the octagon circle combination and one of the Amazonian geoglyphs. Um, here's the great circle at Newark. It is a true henge. I'm sure everybody knows what a henge is. A henge is a ditch with an embankment outside the ditch. That's why we know that the henges were never used for defense. 
if you want to create a defensive moat, you put it outside your embankment. You don't put your embankment outside the moat. Um, the Great Circle at Newark is a true henge with the embankment outside the ditch, just as Avery in the southwest of England is a true henge. And actually, they're both about the same size. The Great Circle is 365.9 meters. Avery is 347.4 meters. Uh, this is uh, Avery. Uh, you can see the the ditch, the uh, the the, the uh, embankment outside the ditch, and perhaps a clearer view in this in this aerial. So the ditch runs all the way round the Avery Sacred Plaza. The embankment is outside it, and then we see just a few of the remaining stones that were once within it. Uh, that paired circle in the Amazon is a true henge. The embankment is outside the ditch. Um, and again, this is a true henge where the embankment is square in this case, but the embankment is outside the ditch. And there's a, there's a squaring of the circle going on here, an interesting geometrical exercise that supposedly was discovered by the Greeks, and yet we're finding it here in the Amazon, and we find it in Pike County, Ohio. This site no longer exists, but it was mapped in 1848, this geometrical exercise of squaring the circle. And oddly enough, at Avery, uh, it's recently been found that in the second of the two internal circles within the Great Circle, uh, there was also once a megalithic square. The perimeter of Newark's Great Square on the left is equal to the circumference of the Great Circle at the center, while its area is equal to the area of the observatory circle right. So, again, we are seeing the fingerprints of geometers, mathematicians, astronomers uh, at work here. I, won't, I don't have time to go into the <laughs> details of this, but just as the sun has stopping points along the horizon, which we call the solstices, the moon has an 18.6 year cycle where it reaches maximum and minimum extremes. And all of these points are targeted, every single one of them, by the alignments in the Newark uh, octagon and circle combination, with the key alignment being the maximum northern moonrise at Newark, which lines up beautifully uh, in this way. Uh, Cahokia in Illinois is all about the sun. We're looking at so-called Monk's Mound here. And to the left of Monk's Mound is uh, a wood henge uh, to, to, to the west of Monk's Mound. Um, and uh, that wood henge has been reconstructed by modern archaeologists. And uh, what we find is that it was an astronomical device designed to target the rising sun on the solstices and on the equinox. And the equinox alignment is particularly clear, and that's the effect that you get there. So I think it's really fair to say that on the ground, despite the fact that more than 90% of it has been swept away, despite the fact that most of the Amazon has never been surveyed at all, uh, we, we can say that in the Americas there, there, there existed a civilization and a spiritual system built around sophisticated observations of the heavens. And the question is, how far back can this be traced? Here's Poverty Point, southern Louisiana. That goes back 2,430 years. Uh, the key feature there is not so much that mound I've just shown you, but these ridges at Poverty Point. Uh, the astronomical survey has been done. There are perfect alignments to all the solstice and equinox uh, points in those ridges. Not only that, but uh, due south of Poverty Point, two or three miles due south, is Lower Jackson Mound. And Lower Jackson Mound is much older than Poverty Point. Lower, Lower Jackson Mound goes back to 3,500 BC, five and a half thousand years ago. Uh, and yet, the makers of Poverty Point used it as the datum point to set out the whole of Poverty Point. They clearly manifested a connection with this much more ancient mound by lining, it up, by, by lining their three main mounds up principally uh, with it. Uh, Watson Break another 3,500 BC site, 5,500 years old. And again, it's full of solstitial and equilocturial alignments and geometry. Uh, there is a shared geometrical system based around 60 degree equilateral triangles. Uh, and as we trace it back, we find that the trail only begins to fade out between 7,500 and 8,000 years ago, bearing in mind the massive destruction of North American earthwork sites uh, I think it's possible that the trail once went back much further than that. It certainly does in the Amazon at Pinal do Pilau. Again, I don't have time to give you the details. It's all in the book if you want to check it out. 
Um, but uh, there are solstitial and equinoctial alignments at Pinel do Pilar. There's even a calendar there. Uh, and this site is well established at 13,000 years old. So it seems that in the old world, we have this meme of geometry, of alignments of marriage of sky and ground, and it seems in the new world, we have the same meme replicating their uh, geometry and alignments to sky and ground. Now, we've been taught that civilization is an old world invention. In fact, there's a book called History Begins at Sumer, which is a very influential book indeed, uh, and that traces the whole origins of civilization to Mesopotamia between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Uh, but America has just been ignored. The notion that America might have anything to do with the origins of civilization has never been considered by archaeologists because they have a view about when the Americas were first people. And until very recently, that view was that the Americas were not peopled until 13,400 years ago. Sea levels were lower. The Bering Straits were a land bridge. But as you crossed them, you encountered this gigantic ice cap two miles deep. And it wasn't until 13,400 years ago that a corridor opened up. And that's when it's thought that people were able to enter the Americas and begin the peopling of the Americas. But in the past five years, this orthodox view has begun to fall apart. It's begun to fall apart partly because of genetics, because it cannot possibly explain this kind of genetic uh, signal. Uh, and uh, it's falling apart too because the old dogma, the dogma that was in place for more than 50 years, which is called Clovis I, can no longer stand. I'm often accused of being a pseudoscientist, but the Clovis I dogma of American archaeology is, in my mind, the ultimate example of pseudoscience. Clovis I, the idea that the culture that the American archaeologists call the Clovis people were the first Americans, that they entered America 13,400 years ago, that they mysteriously vanished 12,800 years ago, that dominated American archaeology for more than 50 years, and it's only in the last five or six years that uh, archaeologists have begun to change their minds. Um, there were careers ruined. Jack Sunk Mars, a great archaeologist, found evidence of human presence in the Americas 25,000 years ago. His research funding was withdrawn. He was accused of lying. He was accused of making the whole thing up. He, he, his life was literally ruined by fellow archaeologists saying, our dogma is right, your new evidence is false. But he was right. He was right. And he was vindicated in later research. Uh, and and uh, as, a, as a result, the Smithsonian accepts that today, decades later, the Clovis I model has collapsed. Uh, it can no longer stand. It's been overwhelmed. This is a paradigm shift when new evidence cannot any longer be explained by the previous paradigm. Uh, a number of archaeologists have been trying to get this message across for a long time and have been totally ignored by their colleagues. Al Goodyear at the University of South, South Carolina uh, took me to the site he excavated of Topper. And uh, Topper is a very rich Clovis site uh, in uh, South Carolina, uh, but Al Goodyear did something that was forbidden by the archaeological dogma of the day. When he reached the bottom of the Clovis level, he decided to dig further. See, previously, if you dug below the Clovis level, you were regarded as an idiot by your colleagues, because, of course, archaeologists knew that there were no human beings in the Americas before Clovis. But when Al dug deeper, he went down to 50,000 years ago and found evidence of human beings there making tools living in that area. And then nature, April 2017, the Ceruti Mastodon site. Suddenly we discover that there's evidence of human beings in America 130,000 years ago. That's 70,000 years longer than human beings have been in Europe. Uh, and this work comes from Tom Demeray, who's the chief paleontologist at the San Diego Natural History Museum. He has taken an enormous amount of violent criticism from archaeologists who are just horrified by the idea that humans might have been in the Americas for 130,000 years ago. And again, what we see is the dogma trying to smash the new evidence and destroy it in every way possible. But Tom Demeray's evidence is solid, was solid enough to make it into nature. He was kind enough to go through it all with me. Again, I'm sorry I don't have time to give you the backup, but the details are, are in the book. That site is, in my opinion, very clearly a 130,000-year-old human site where human beings scavenged the carcass of a mastodon, broke its bones open, and uh, extracted the marrow. 
That's, of course, not a high civilization at work. But what that's telling us is that the human species was in North America 130,000 years ago. And if they've been there for that long in this vast, resource-rich landmass, may have been the location of hitherto unrecognized advances and developments in the story of civilization. Because archaeologists never looked at that 100,000 years, because they, their dogma convinced them there was nothing to look for. And if we start looking in that 100,000 years, what are we going to find? 100,000 years is more than enough time for a high civilization to uh, evolve. Why did archaeologists miss it? Well, part of it is because of a cataclysm. Uh, this is Murray Springs in Arizona. And you can see this uh, black line running along the wall here. It's called the Black Mat. And here are the remains of a mammoth that they named Eloise. Uh, and draped over the top of her was the bottom of this black mat. And in the bottom of the black mat are a number of chemical and mineral signatures. And those chemical and mineral signatures include iridium, uh, melt glass, um, platinum, carbon microspherules, nanodiamonds. And taken in abundance in the way that they're found, they can only be explained by a cosmic impact, by something hitting the Earth at very high speed uh, from outer space. And, and those impact proxies, as they're called, are all found at the bottom of the black mat and directly on top of the remains of the last megafauna, because this was the time that the megafauna became extinct. And since 2007, really compelling case has been put together by more than 60 eminent scientists that the North American ice cap was hit 12,800 years ago by several large fragments of a disintegrating comet. They call themselves the Comet Research Group. I'm going to come on to their work in more detail in a minute, but we all accept that the dinosaurs were made extinct by a cosmic impact, possibly an asteroid, possibly a comet. Uh, and that extinction event 65 million years ago left a layer in the soil exactly like the Younger Dryas boundary layer, that black map that I showed you, containing exactly the same impact proxies. Uh, Lewis and Walter Alvarez, who initially proposed an asteroid impact as the um, cause of the extinction of the dinosaurs, were quite satisfied with the impact proxies. They knew they were right, but their critics wouldn't accept it. For 10 years, they were massively attacked, subjected to all kinds of ad hominem attacks, humiliating abuse, and then they found the crater. And the crater is in the Gulf of Mexico, and after that, the objections went away. And we all know that the dinosaurs were made extinct by a cosmic impact. Uh, and it was a world-changing event. Uh, it turned, literally, dinosaurs into chickens, uh, because that's all that's left of the dinosaur line. And meanwhile, this little mammal that was skulking in the primeval forests, mammals had been going nowhere, but once the dinosaurs were swept out of the way, wow, the mammal line began to evolve and fill previously uninhabitable niches, and that's why we say, meet your 65-million-year-old mother, because we are here because of the extinction of the dinosaurs. The world story would have been very different if that had not happened. NASA wants to be very reassuring, and it tells us that such uh, world-changing events are very rare. In fact, NASA seems to believe that the universe is so Germanic in its timekeeping that we can set our clocks by it. NASA says these impacts happen once every 100 million years. And since the last one was 65 million years ago, we have nothing to worry about for at least the next 35 million years. A number of astronomers disagree profoundly. We've all seen meteors. What meteors are, and NASA is helpfully telling us this, they are all meteor showers are the remnants of disintegrated comets. Comets that have fallen into multiple, multiple pieces, and those pieces have smashed against each other, and the fragments Small fragments come through our sky, and we see them as meteorites. And NASA says, don't worry, because very few of them are larger than the size of boulders, and they're not going to do much harm on Earth. Well, it's a curious thing, but no culture in the world uh, sees the arrival of a comet in the sky as good news. It's always seen as bad news. Uh, and it was certainly would have been bad news if Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 had hit the Earth in 1994 instead of Jupiter. Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 broke up into 21 glowing fragments, and those fragments hit Jupiter with such massive force that they created scars on the surface of Jupiter larger than the Earth itself. The entire explosive power was 300 gigatons. If you blew up the whole nuclear arsenal of the Earth, it would amount to just 6.4 gigatons. 
These are gigantic events. And something made the megafauna extinct 12,800 years ago. And that extinction was massively focused uh, on the Americas. Uh, and uh, Bill Napier, who's the professor of astrobiology at Cardiff University, uh, is a leading expert in this field. And he and his colleagues have presented powerful evidence that an enormous comet entered the inner solar system about 20,000 years ago. Uh, and that that comet continues to orbit in the inter inner solar system. But as all comets do, it broke up into multiple fragments. And 12,800 years ago, several of those fragments hit the Earth with the epicenter on the North American ice cap, causing the Paleolithic extinctions. And he refers to it as the Paleolithic extinctions and the Torrid complex, because the calculations are that the Torrid meteor stream through which we still pass twice a year is the remnant of that disintegrated comet which bombarded the Earth massively 12,800 years ago, and which still contains very large fragments of the original comet, including Comet Enki, Comet Olgiato, Comet Rudniki, and 19 of the brightest near-Earth objects. We pass through this torrid meteor stream twice a year. It's 30 million kilometers wide. Each passage takes 12 and a half days. I liken it to strapping on a blindfold and crossing an eight-lane eight motorway and just hoping that we don't hit uh, any traffic as we appear to have done 12,800 years ago. It's called the Torrid Meteor Stream because it appears to emanate from the region of the sky dominated by the constellation of Taurus. Uh, we pass through in June and we pass through again in November. Uh, the last object to fall out of the Torrid Meteor Stream that's been documented caused the Tunguska event in early June 1908. It was between 60 and 190 meters wide. It didn't even reach the ground. It blew up in the sky, but it flattened 80 million trees across an area of more than 2,000 square kilometers. That's an area larger than London. It would have flattened the entire city of London as far out as the M25. Uh, and if it had happened over a major city, we'd be paying much more attention to the Torrid Meteor Stream now than we are presently doing. The astronomers have been looking at the sky. Another group of scientists have been looking at the ground. And their, uh, their work is the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. And they include very major figures. There are no fringe scientists here. They're all leading figures in their field. Um, and they were initially attracted by a mystery. The world was very cold 21,300 years ago, the last glacial maximum. And then it began to warm up. Sea levels began gradually to rise. Um, and then suddenly, 12,800 years ago, you get this collapse in temperatures. The world gets incredibly cold. This is the moment that the megafauna be begin to become extinct. And at the same time, mysteriously, sea level rises. In a period of freeze, sea level should not rise. That water should be freezing on the ice caps, not going into the sea. Uh, and this period, the Younger Dryas, as it's called, lasts for 1,200 years. And then there's an equally rapid rise in temperatures, another massive sea level rise 11,600 years ago. And we enter the modern era of the Holocene. I don't expect you to read these, but here are some of the papers published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, the Journal of uh, Geology, uh, Science Reports, and many other major papers by the Comet Research Group. Nano Diamond Rich Lair across three continents consistent with major cosmic impact of 12,800 calendar years before the present. Um, this is tracking the size of the Younger Dryas boundary field, the areas directly affected by the impacts. PT anom platinum anomalies picked up in Greenland. Those same platinum anomalies in a 2017 study found in North America, all over North America. Evidence of a 2018 paper, extraordinary biomass burning uh, across the world 12,800 years ago, exactly what you would expect with comet impacts. Evidence that the boundary field is much wider than was originally supposed, that it goes down to Antarctica, uh, that uh, it goes down to southern Chile. Um, evidence of enormous flooding on the North American continent. If any civilization had been based in the area of the Channel Scablands, it would have been wiped away utterly and completely. This iron meteorite was carried to that area uh, in an iceberg uh, in floods 12,800 years ago. These huge erratic boulders, uh, this one weighs 18,000 tons. It got there in an iceberg the size of an oil tanker 
carried on those enormous floods, and they're scattered all over the Pacific Northwest, speaking of an enormous, truly humongous cataclysm. Dry falls, a fossilized waterfall created in just two weeks by those floods. To give you a sense of the scale, that's Niagara Falls uh, in the picture. Uh, we've all seen little ripples on the beach when the tide goes out, current ripples. Nature is fractal. There are current ripples in the Pacific Northwest of America as well, except there, those current ripples are 50 feet high and hundreds of feet long, speaking of the massive nature of the cataclysm that affected the area. And this damage goes all the way across North America. There's evidence of a huge impact in northeastern North America, and crater remains dated to 12,800 years ago in northeastern North America. And just recently, another massive impact crater found in Greenland, 32 kilometers across. All the evidence suggests that we can date that back to 12,800 years ago as well, although more work needs to be done. Uh, and you can see how close it is to North America. This was the epicenter of a truly global cataclysm. So gradually, the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis is gaining ground. It still attracts a lot of hostility and opposition, but they just keep on coming out with new evidence. And this is the way that paradigms shift. The world got cold because that flood of icy meltwater stopped the Gulf Stream in its tracks. Stop the Gulf Stream in its tracks, and that's the central heating system of our planet, and that's why the planet got cold. Why did it get hot? 11,600 years ago, Fred Hoyle suggested we had another encounter with fragments of the comet. This time, the fragments hit a major ocean. They created giant tidal waves. They threw up a mass of water vapor into the upper atmosphere, and uh, that caused a greenhouse effect, which accounts for the warming, and the sudden rise of sea level 11,600 years ago, which is nominated by geologists, Meltwater Pulse 1b. And this is where I ask, is Turtle Island Atlantis? Is North America possibly Atlantis? Because Plato's date for the destruction and submergence of Atlantis was 11,600 years ago. And if he made the story up, as archaeologists say, that's astonishingly on the money with the latest geological evidence for Meltwater Pulse 1b. Um, Plato got the story through his family line, uh, uh, through the Greek lawmaker Solon, who went to Egypt in 600 BC, and when Solon asked the priests who told him about Atlantis, when did this happen, when was it swallowed up by the sea, they said 9,000 years ago. 9,000 years ago in 600 BC is, um, 11, is, is sorry, 9,600 BC is 11,600 years ago, which is Meltwater Pulse 1b. Um, Plato tells us how advanced Atlantis was, how it was once a beautiful spiritual culture, but how, in the end, it became corrupt, it became wicked, it began to impose its power around the world, it became conceited and big-headed, it, it ceased to carry its prosperity with moderation. And Plato tells us how, when the cataclysm came, it wasn't the advanced citizens of Atlantis who survived, it was the hunter-gatherers, the shepherds, the meek of the earth who survived. And, and that's why mankind has to begin all over again like children, knowing nothing of what happened in ancient times uh, because of these periodic cataclysmic disasters. So the work of the Comet Research Group opens up the very real possibility that something enormous has been missed uh, in North America, the epicenter of the Younger Dryas Cataclysm. And I want to finish within the next five minutes. I hope I won't be chased off the stage. Um, if there's doubts about the origins of civilization, there's also doubt about its future. This 100 million year intervals between extinction level events is complacent and irresponsible. In fact, we're surrounded by a cat's cradle of asteroids and comets. And about 99% of those that are there have not yet been identified by NASA, and it's beginning to realize that we may not live in such a safe time at all. We keep getting wake-up calls from the universe, these near misses where an asteroid we've never seen before whizzes by between the Earth and the Moon, 17, 2018, 2019, it just keeps on, keeps on coming. Uh, but it's this complex of debris, the Taurid meteor stream, that is identified uh, as the unique this unique complex of debris is undoubtedly the greatest collision hazard facing the Earth at the present time. And it's a choice. This is not about gloom and doom. We already have the capacity to sweep our cosmic environment clean. If we were to stop investing 
trillions of dollars and pounds in weapons of mass destruction so that we can murder one another in ever more efficient manners. And if we were to come together as a human species and collectively decide that we are going to make sure that our children and our children's children always have a safe planet to live on, first of all, we would learn to love one another instead of to hate and fear and suspect one another. And secondly, we would have the capacity to make sure that no cosmic impact need ever occur again. My goodness, they're talking about mining asteroids. If they can mine them, they can move them. Uh, if you live in one of the great technological cities, you never see the stars, you never see the sky because of light pollution. But if you look down from a NASA satellite, you can see that the industrialized parts of the world are brightly lit, lit up like a string of jewels. Whereas the Sahara Desert and Namibia are completely dark because there's no electricity there, and this is often taken as a sort of symbol of the technological advancement uh, of certain countries. And uh, if we go over to the Western Hemisphere, you can see North America lit up like a string of jewels, and the Amazon jungle completely dark. And in fact, in the Amazon jungle, in the very state of Acre, uh, where those geoglyphs have been found, there continue to be uncontacted tribes. Tribes of hunter-gatherers who do not even know we exist. What do they think when they see an aircraft flying overhead? But if the world today were not to make the choice to preserve the Earth from this danger, and if we were to suffer another impact like those of 12,800 years ago, I don't think that our civilization would survive it. I think as we're so spoiled, we're so used, we don't know how to survive as individuals, we survive as a collective. We, we're, we're so used to having food on the tables, roofs over our heads, clothes on our backs. Strip all that away, and within two weeks, the moral fabric of this society would completely collapse, and it, I believe it would, would collapse into a state of utter chaos. But those who are psychologically equipped to survive, and who have the skills to survive, would be the meek of the earth, would be the hunter-gatherers. It would be the descendants of people like these who would survive such a cataclysm. And 12,000 years from now, who's to say that those descendants would not have a myth about how they once existed on Earth? An amazing civilization. They were so advanced that they were almost gods. They could send men to the moon. They could speak to one another on opposite sides of the planet. Their powers were almost supernatural, and yet they became corrupt, they became cruel, they began to impose their power around the world, they became conceited in their pride, they ceased to carry their prosperity with moderation, and the universe slapped them down. So, you know, let's make sure we're, we're not the next lost civilization. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. through that at such super high speed. It's really meant to be a 90 minute talk. My heart is pounding. Um, I'm, I'm um, not supposed to go on longer than this. I'd love to do questions, but I am going to be sitting outside. Um, I am going to be there to sign books. I will happily take questions individually.